Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to this two-part short mini-series, The Thames Valley Churches of Christ in August 2023. And what I've managed to do is get my old friend Douglas Jacobi to agree for us to steal, I mean borrow, a couple of his classes for our benefit. And the two that I've selected are on those two little epistles in the New Testament that are so often not talked about, and those are the little epistles of Jude and Philemon. And we're going to look at those over the next uh, couple of weeks, and I'd like to see what you think about them. And by the way, while we're talking about Douglas Jacobi, can I please recommend that you go to his website and look at the vast myriad of resources there. If you've got Bible questions or you want to find devotional materials, go to douglasjacobi.com. And if you would, I would also recommend that you sign up for his newsletter that I get every week and I find to be tremendously refreshing and beneficial to my faith. That having been said, Let's let Douglas loose on us here with some thoughts on this week, the book of Philemon, which you might want to read in advance. It would definitely help you get more out of the class, though not absolutely necessary. And after he's finished, I'll come back with some questions for us to discuss in our groups. Now let's go on to Douglas's take on the book of Philemon. Well, possibly at the same time that Paul wrote Colossians, he also wrote Philemon. They're sent to the same part of the world, in fact, the same valley, the same area. And if you compare the names at the end of each letter, you'll see that these people all knew each other. At any rate, Paul writes Philemon. It's one of the four prison letters. Philemon is a personal letter, but it's not private. That would be a mistake. This is Paul's shortest letter. It's, he's really trying to motivate one person, Philemon, to take a certain course of action, which has implications for the Christian faith, for unity. And the second main character is Onesimus, and I'll tell you more about them in just a moment. But Paul writes a personal letter in the middle, that is from verse 4 to 22, he's speaking only to Philemon, the recipient. We know that because the word you in Greek is you singular. Whereas in the beginning of the letter, the first few verses, and the very end, it's opened up and he's speaking to you plural, that is a group of people. In other words, it's personal, but it's not private because people are listening in. There's an audience. People want to know what is going to happen here and what is happening. Now, before we read the letter in its full uh, entirety of all 25 verses, um, let's talk about these two men. Philemon is not just a Christian leader. He's wealthy. First, he has a church meeting in his home. He's not living in a hut. He's got a home big enough to even have a guest room. And he has a servant. Possibly he has more servants, but one servant has run away. So this is Philemon, probably married. It's suggested that Afia is his wife. We only see her name in passing uh, at the, in the uh, intro to the letter. And then there's Onesimus, his servant, who ran away. Now, I know there's a mental or a heart block right here for many of us. We think, wait a minute, wait a minute. Philemon was a Christian, he had slaves. Worse, he's a Christian leader and he had slaves. Well, obviously, if he was abusing Philemon, that would be a sin. But the relationship of an employer to an employee could range from forced labor all the way up to almost being, uh, well, partners, being associates. Slavery in the ancient world is not the way it was in the modern world, particularly if we're thinking of the experience in the Americas. That is, especially South America, the Caribbean, and um, the North American mainland. If this bothers you, please take time to listen to my podcast, Slavery in the Bible. I think that could really help. We don't have time to deal with the issue right here. So there's Philemon and there's Onesimus, his servant. Now Onesimus is a um, cool name. Uh, I think I've only met one person in my life named Onesimus, but it simply means handy. It's the Greek word for useful. And that will become a word play in the letter. You may catch it as I read. And he has run away. He was not a Christian. He stole, actually stole from Philemon, and he ended up bumping into Paul. Paul's in prison. This might be in Ephesus, or it may be in Rome. No one knows for sure. But he meets Paul, and he becomes a Christian, and now Paul is sending him back, which is amazing, and Onesimus apparently is going, which is amazing. In fact, Onesimus may be delivering this letter himself. And Onesimus, who's now a brother. Well, everyone's watching. Philemon is such a cool letter. I love to teach from it. 
because it's a lesson in motivation and unity and what's really important. I'm going to read the letter in its vast entirety from the New Revised Standard Version. Please listen. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you, now it's you, Philemon, you singular. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do in Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you, to do your duty, yet I'd rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child, my son, Onesimus, now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. No, I skipped it. Let me go back. I'm appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I've become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me, and I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother. Let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Hmm. One thing more. Prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's a letter of Philemon, or the letter to Philemon, New Revised Standard Version. There's so much we could say. What Paul wants Philemon to do is to give Onesimus his freedom. In a way, he wants him to share his faith in a different way. Um, he wants to share, he's going to share freedom with Onesimus. He's going to share bountifully and even cancel Onesimus's debt, because Paul says, I'll pay it if it must be paid. And... This kind of sharing of the faith is, well, of course it has an evangelistic impact, but sharing one's faith is much more than talking to a stranger, though that's a wonderful thing. We share our faith with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a key word that appeared three times, and maybe you notice this. In verse 7, he says, I've received much encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. Okay, now in the first part of the letter, Paul is identifying most closely with Philemon, but notice that word heart. And then in the middle, he switches over to Onesimus. We read in verse 12, I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. So now he's identifying with Onesimus. And in the rest of the letter, he's, and the word heart appears a third time. He's like he's standing between Philemon and Onesimus trying to get them together, bringing them together. And we read that third verse, yes, brother, let me have this benefit from, you, benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So that's what will happen when Philemon receives the letter from Onesimus' hand. You imagine they look at each other, it may be a bit awkward at first, but they embrace, all is forgiven, and things change. Well, at least this is what Paul is hoping for. Well, it may be surprising to you that he would send a servant back to a master. In fact, this was forbidden in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 23, 15. But... These are Christians, not living under the Old Testament. And besides, there's a more important issue, and that's the unity of the church. Okay, what do we learn here? What do we learn from 
Paul and the way he handles this situation. And I think this can help all of us because all of us have relationships with others. And if you're in any position of influence or if you're a Christian leader, this will be very important. Paul begins very positively. Just read those early verses. There's a gentleness, a sweetness of his spirit. It's all about relationship. He, he clearly loves Onesimus and he clearly loves Philemon. It's about relationship. But that doesn't mean he's not persuasive. He's not weakly suggesting maybe sometime in the next 10 or 20 years you could let Onesimus go, give him his freedom. He's actually asking for his freedom now. And although, yes, he's not commanding him, he doesn't want to force the issue, yet what he says is quite persuasive and in some ways quite forceful. He mentions, for example, okay, he may have robbed you, but remember, you owe me something. You owe me your actual salvation. He reminds Philemon that Paul's an old man. There are things he'd like to do, but he needs help. And in a way, Onesimus is giving the help that perhaps Philemon himself would like to give. He mentions that he's a prisoner. Oh yeah, he's a prisoner. Not just an old man, he's an old prisoner. The one who actually brought Philemon to the Lord. And if that's not enough, you have the fact that the whole church are watching. They're watching this interaction. They're waiting. They'll find out what the outcome is. Paul doesn't order them around. He's not a bully. He doesn't use force. He motivates by the relationship. Last year, I did several podcasts on the very important issue of control. I, I share how, certainly in my earlier years as a Christian leader, I was far more controlling than I should have been. In fact, I really shouldn't have been controlling at all. And I think I have a better balance now, but all that means is maybe I'm improving. I still got a long way to go. And that's why when I read the letter of Philemon, I know in my heart that that's the way I should treat other people, from my wife to relations and family, strangers, brothers and sisters in the church. And I try to do that, but I don't always succeed. In fact, I often fail. So I always will need the letter of Philemon. It's short, but powerful. What a package. Uh, Paul is not a bully. He motivates by love. He makes an appeal. You also notice that Paul doesn't bury the issue. A lot of times there's something sensitive, or there's a clear problem in a church. And the church leaders think, really, we should just deal with it ourselves. We shouldn't let others know, because if they do, they might have an opinion or they might get angry or not understand. And yes, there are times where some information is sensitive and discretion is demanded. I understand that. But this is quite public. I mean, Philemon's going back, it's a new member, and once, once people realize, wait a minute, isn't that the servant who used to work at the house of Philemon and Afia? You know, this was not something that could be private. It just wasn't. They don't bury the issue. There's transparency and there's openness and the church is watching. And that's why I think, not only do I need the letter of Philemon, but I believe this is a powerful message for the modern church. And I hope that as you continue to read this letter in the rest of your Christian life, however many years that is, you'll continue to have an open heart because really it's all about heart. God bless. Thanks for listening. So what did you think of that class? Firstly, what spoke to you personally? What was relevant to you from what Douglas talked about from this amazing little book of Philemon? Secondly, what might be relevant to your group? It might be different from somebody else's group. Thirdly, how do we decide what is private and what is meant to be public in our faith community, in our family group, our small group, our location? How do we make those decisions? Some things should be confidential. Some things should be public, like this situation with Philemon, or perhaps Euodia and Syntyche in Philippians chapter 4. Names are mentioned. Now, how do we decide that? And then finally, and perhaps I think perhaps most significantly for our day-to-day -day life in our groups, is how do, we, how do we seek to persuade one another in a healthy way, persuade one another to godliness and godly behavior without controlling without trying to control, without even perhaps subconsciously controlling. How do we do that? Persuasion without control. Those could be useful things to discuss in our groups. By the way, if you'd like to deepen your knowledge of the scriptures, why not join Douglas and me and Andy Bawachi for the AIM UK and Ireland program? Uh, this next module is on homiletics, which is basically about how to speak well from the Bible to other people. It applies to all Christians, not just preachers and teachers, uh, who do that regularly. 
So if you'd like to be interested, if you're interested in that, like to join us, uh, please do drop me a line or go to the website, which is aimukandireland.com. It's all one word, aimukandireland, and you'll find all the details there. Next time, we'll go on to the book of Jude, which um, we're going to entitle Blown, Uprooted, Wandering. That's for next time. Till then, take care.